when somebody's on their deathbed or near the end of their life or contemplating the end of their life, there, there's probably two things that they that they think about. Who didn't I form a relationship with or what do I what regrets do I have over the relationships that weren't deep enough? And two, they have the gratitude over the deep connections that they've had in their lives. Really, that's about it. OK, um, everybody that I've talked to um, th that those are two out. So th that's all based on emotion. And um, so I needed to find a framework. Uh, what emotions do we have in common and why do we have different emotional responses to things? Because you know, as well as I do, that somebody could look at something um, and have fear or somebody could look at something and have joy because it's an opportunity, right? They might have fear because it's an obstacle. Somebody else might have joy because it's an opportunity. It's the same thing. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi, an activist who is passionate about building a better, brighter, and more sustainable future for all of us. Every week, I invite you on a journey to care more so that together we can all be better. If you haven't already, I encourage you to please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. This simple action helps us reach more people each week. Today, I am thrilled to introduce you to my next guest. He's an endurance athlete, author, and friend of the show, David Richmond. David is an entrepreneur. He's an athlete, a philanthropist, and so much more. His first book, Winning in the Middle of the Pack, shares how to get more out of ourselves than we ever imagined possible. And this resonates with me in particular because I've always felt like that's part of my purpose in life, to help people realize their full potential. Now, with his second book, Cycle of Lives, he shares the interconnected stories of overcoming the most difficult obstacles that we face, specifically diseases known under the umbrella term of cancer. With Cycle of Lives, David shares 15 real stories and unique perspectives of trials and triumphs with victory and with defeat. He invites us to embark on this journey of stories as he travels with us to meet the people featured in this book, these 15 stories, as he solo cycled to connect with each in person from his home in Los Angeles in California to Florida to New York in a 5,000 mile epic cycling adventure. David, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Karina. I'm very excited to talk to you. Yeah, you know, I received my copy of the book a couple of days back, and I was able to get through the first of the 15 stories. And I say get through because it's a little emotional at times, but also inspiring. Um, even in the end, in, in that case, in that first story's case of the tragedy. So what a journey. But before we really get into talking about that, as I alluded in my intro, I'm also passionate about helping people you know, really achieve what they didn't think was possible. So I'd like to learn a little bit more about this particular book, that middle of the pack story and succeeding mm -hmm. from the middle. Sure. So thank you. And in the middle of the pack wasn't a contrived thing. It just was like a lightning bolt that hit me. Um, I was in my late thirties, uh, had accomplished quite a bit, but also had um, found myself unaware of kind of my purpose in life, what my goals in life were. I just kind of was making my way through life, not on purpose, but just kind of on accident. And I found myself in my late thirties, Karina, at a pretty low point in my life. I uh, was overweight. I was a smoker. I was uh, completely stressed out um, from work. I was in a, uh, an abusive relationship, um, uh, four-year-old twins and kind of needed to get me and them out of that situation. I was overweight. I was uh, not active. There was just a lot of things that were, were going on. And, and I just um, kind of like a number of things hit me at one time, like, like mm. this awareness of where I was at and how I was just kind of accidentally making my way through life rather than on purpose. And um, the tasks that were created or that I created for myself weren't the healthiest of tasks. Um, you know, I'd find myself in bad relationships so I could fix them or I would 
um, you know, find myself in a stressful, you know, job just so I could prove that I could do it. But that, nothing was really working. And I just um, kind of was hit with a, a lightning bolt discussion uh, from a friend who uh, really gave me some insight. I, I was hit with a really difficult conversation from my sister that gave me some perspective. And I also um, probably looked at myself in the mirror for the first time. And, and that conversation with my friend was when I was done complaining for the millionth time about all the bad things that were going on in my life, he finally just said, look, dude, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you're the problem. Hmm. Like nobody else is the problem. You're the problem. Like everything you touch is a rabid dog and you try to pet the rabid dog and then it bites you and you get all bummed out because it bit you. He goes, why don't you worry about your own problems and stop trying to fix everything else? And I'm like, wow, you know, that kind of made sense um, for the first time, right? It, hard to hear. Of, hear. Very hard, hard to, to hear, hear, I imagine. Very hard to hear. Yeah, because it's easy when things are hard to complain the things that are hard. Right? It's, e it's easy to do that. Oh, you know, uh, you know, my, my, and my wife at the time, you know, she's so mean or, you know, she's so angry or she's so violent or whatever. Well, maybe I was the problem, not her or, hmm. you know, different ways to look at it. Um, the conversation with my sister uh, came at the same time that I was kind of getting this awareness, which, you know, again, you don't know until you know, right? And I didn't know until I knew. Um, but my sister said, uh, called me up one day and said, yeah, geez, I got some news and it's not, it's not real good, but let's talk about it. I've got terminal brain cancer. Mm. And with a husband and young kids and a beautiful job and a beautiful circle of friends and living a very happy kind of stress-free life as opposed to me that really hit me because I was so happy for her to be in such a great spot um, us both having come out of you know kind of some severe trauma as youngsters um, that she, I admired that in her and and it was like oh man like even living her best life it was going to end soon and that really gave me some perspective and then Kind of those two things combined made me look in the mirror and go, like, who are you? And what are you hmm. what are you doing? And what are you trying to accomplish? And I realized I didn't have any answers. And so I embarked on some answers, you know, and tried to try to see what I was made of. And that's where the idea of that middle of the pack came in. Um, and, and I can go into that a little bit more if you like. Well, I think it's so interesting because as you as you dive into this second book. I'm hearing, I think, some of the same themes throughout, mm -hmm. or at least from what I've read thus far, where it really is one part self-analysis and being real with where you are, with acknowledging the pain and the trauma that you might be going through when someone close to you or even yourself is diagnosed with something as, in some cases, terminally final as cancer can be. And so even as, you know, science continues to go forward and as people in proper treatment are often on a path to recovery, it can be that event that blindsides you, that, that causes you to take that cold, hard look in the mirror and really get honest with yourself, with yourself in a way that you might not have been in a prior moment. And I think everyone listening to this show is going to have had at some point in their lives a personal connection to somebody that they were close with that got a diagnosis of cancer. I mean, I myself, it started for me when I was nine years old. And my grandmother, who I love dearly, was diagnosed with melanoma skin cancer. And she was someone who, you know, she's, she was very active. Nobody expected her to succumb to such a disease at only 63. And I know 63, I mean, you're in your 60s, okay, you're, you know, a good life, I guess. But it was so fast and so dramatic because they had not discovered the cancer until it was too late. Um, one of the things you talk about in your book is the stage at which somebody is diagnosed and how you worked to, in compiling these stories of 15 people, mm -hmm. work to find people that were at any stage in this journey, like some people who might have found out that they had a diagnosis at stage one versus others at stage four the survivors and also those that, you know, didn't survive telling their stories through their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And so as I commence this journey with you, as I commenced reading it yesterday, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
um, I reflected on those moments, those difficult moments where it was hard to understand even what was happening to someone you cared so deeply for. So I want for us to start this conversation in a way from, from that perspective where you're, you actually selected people to tell their stories, to walk through their trials and tribulations, and in some cases their success. How, how did that start? How did, how did this whole journey start with Cycle of Lives? Right. So the, the whole journey started from what we just finished talking about a little bit was the middle of the pack, right? So the middle of the pack for me um, allowed me to embark on this journey of self-discovery through endurance athletics, which was completely foreign to who I was. And what you said at the very beginning of this kind of, you know, be better, get more out of yourself is I hadn't been ever used to measuring my self-worth based on how I felt about me. I always measured it based on what I thought others thought of me or the problems that I could solve or how good I could do against my competition at work or whatever. It never was self-motivating, um, self-setting goals, right? And so with, with endurance athletics, I said, well, let's go see what you can accomplish and see in the middle of the pack where nobody's looking and nobody's watching, right? I mean, everybody watches the people at the front. And who doesn't want to cheer the last person across the line, but everybody else in between, they don't, nobody cares. Nobody's watching. So it's kind of a freeing thing. You could do it for yourself. So what can you accomplish if you're doing it for yourself, man, you could set your goals really, really, really high. Cause it doesn't matter. Nobody else cares. It's, it's what you want to do for yourself. And it's really a cool thing. And so I learned a ton what you just said about looking in the mirror and kind of taking an honest assessment about yourself. I started to learn more about myself and kind of become a little bit more introspective rather than worrying about how I was perceiving others would think of me, just kind of how I interacted with the world from my perspective. And that brought me to the cycle of life. So when June, my sister was going through the last stages of her fight with cancer, I noticed Karina that the caregivers, the doctors, the people that were in, involved in, in uh, uh, her friend circle, her family, everyone, they were really good about dealing with the tasks around the cancer, but they weren't real good about dealing with the emotional side of it. And I really have learned through this project that um, whether or not it's stage zero, just like, you know, not, not, you know, anything major, you know, just even the fear of cancer can be as traumatic as even stage four, you know, terminal cancer, it's just who's to say, how somebody should feel about what's going on in their life. And so um, I, I was really touched by this idea of, of how, why are people so ill-equipped to talk about the emotional side? Why, why do they get really quiet and self-isolate and kind of have that, that inside voice going on? What I noticed was that on the, on the emotional side, people weren't able to start those conversations. So what I tried to do was to say, I'm not going to tell you what's difficult. I'm not going to try to figure out like who's got it worst or whose trauma is affecting them the most. I just want to learn why is it that when it comes to the emotional side of what we're going through, we tend to self-isolate or we tend to not want to invade people's space because I don't want to say the wrong thing. When your grandmother's diagnosed with cancer, I mean, what do I say to you? how do I say something that doesn't make me sound like an idiot? How do I give you a safe space to talk to me about how you're feeling about it? These are really hard subjects. And every person that I spoke to, doctor, patient, loved one, family member, had a degree of, uh, of understanding that that was a difficult thing for them, talking about the emotional side. And that really sparked me into wanting to start this project of the cycle of lives. Well, and I think something that we don't think about often enough is that there is, it's it's like a moment in time of before and after when you have a diagnosis. It's like there's everything that led up to that moment. And then often that moment changes or defines what the rest of that person's experience is going to be. And so you grieve life before. You grieve for the life that existed up until that point that you might have had a diagnosis. I mean, this is something that I've personally seen. It's it's like there's there's a before and after. It's a, it's a defining moment in that way, good or bad. And a lot of people 
like they find themselves through the trauma in a way they, they, you know, are put back in center. They think about what's really important to them and they, they change things about their lives in many cases, but even coming to that point doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily survive the long term. Your, your expiration date may have been moved so much closer than you ever anticipated that the time you have left feels inconsequential. And mm -hmm. so these traumas, these, these things themselves are traumas, even just having to confront your mortality in this way. And I think that when it's not personal to us, when it's not something that we're personally going through, or if we haven't been through that sort of trauma, it becomes really, really hard to relate to one another. And that reality then becomes the part of the lives of the people that are going through it. They're like, well, this person, they can't really understand what I'm going through. So I'm just not going to share it. And then therefore, because they're not sharing it, they become more disconnected. And then that leads to more depression and other challenges that make it harder to get through the hard days. And so I, I just, I, I've been affected perhaps more than many um, when it comes to cancers. I personally also started to become a, a distance athlete when I had a friend get diagnosed with leukemia. I raised $20,000 over a couple seasons running marathons for team and training, mm -hmm. and then becoming a training captain and supporting uh, the journey of others that were doing the same. And both the people I ran in honor of, they, they lost their lives, you know? So when you get close to something like this, when you get close to the grief, when you get into the daily lives of people that are experiencing cancers in particular, I think you also, even as somebody who may not have that diagnosis, you live a little bit of it with them. You get to understand, you get to see behind the curtain of, you know, the, the, the challenge. Yeah. I, and I mean, you can, right. You take the, I mean, a, a, a lot of people do uh, attack uh, the trauma in very positive ways. They help their friends, they support them, they transport them. They uh, take things off of them, unburden them when they can at work or family or whatever. They raise money. They show their support in ways like you did, which are very, very personal. And, um, you know, you, I'm sure you put many, many things on hold so that you could do this to support them. And in, in, it was a way in which you felt you could help and make a difference. Right. So we all do that. Mm -hmm. um, and most people do. And it's great. And it's, it's wonderful. I'm not going to minimize it. I think what happens is. And more the case, and and this is what I've learned from from talking to you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people about this, is that um, those people are not indicative of all of the relationships that are in their lives. Mm -hmm. So there's two sides of this coin. One is I don't sometimes if I'm going through that trauma, I don't want to burden people, right? I don't want to bring them down. I don't want to bring them into my darkened reality. Um, I don't want to. Um, you know, burden them unnecessarily. So there's, there's that side of the coin. And then the other side of the coin is what we just mentioned, which is, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't want to be their space. I mean, I, I, would I bring them down if I talk about how great my life is? I mean, there's a million things that go on that give us kind of the straight arm and, and, and allow us to distance from them because we, we just don't want to do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing. And so, like you just said, it can be very isolating. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what I, what, I, what I tried to do when I thought this through is I tried to say, like, I probably don't know what my sister was going through, even though we were very close and we were very open about talking about it. I couldn't get into her head and understand how she was processing the emotions of this cancer, in her case, terminal, in her case, what was going to take away her family and her from her family. But what I could understand is the traumas in her life that happened earlier that affected her ability or inability to deepen the relationships that she had in her life about this trauma. In other words, um, I knew I could relate to her about these other traumas, which would give me some insight on how to communicate with her about what she was going through at that time. And so what I wanted to do, Karina, when I spoke to people is I might not understand what they're going through with their quote unquote cancer journey, whether they be a doctor or a patient or whatever, but I could understand abandonment or abuse or uh, drug addiction 
or making bad choices in life or the, all the things that happen in our young adulthood and adolescent that kind of form who we are. And so if I knew you better as a nine-year-old and we were friends and I could understand what you went through outside of your grandma, I might have a better way of communicating with you and forming a deeper authentic connection over that thing I can't understand, which mm -hmm. is you trying to process this idea of how this cancer is taking away your grandmother. It just is a way for me to better communicate with you. And I might not be so arms distance or allow you to self isolate. I might try harder and be better equipped to have these hard conversations with you. If, if, if I could understand a little bit more about what these other traumas in your life were, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I'm reflecting now on the first chapter of your book, Cycle of mm -hmm. Lives, which mm -hmm. anybody listening or watching this on YouTube, you can go to cycleoflives.org to find out more about this particular work. But I noticed in the very beginning that you followed a format. So you shared for yourself, your relationship with cancer, you know, um, your age at the time, the family mm -hmm. status, location, first encounter, summary of your cancer journey, treatment specifics, community involvement, et cetera. And then you do the same thing at the beginning of each of the chapters, yeah. which I think helps people to kind of get a framework of understanding for each of the individuals. And I also thought it was really interesting that you were calling out the strongest positive emotion and the strongest negative emotion. I believe in the beginning of the book, you share that you're using mm -hmm. Dr. Pletchik's um, theory of the wheel of emotion. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about the wheel of emotion and how this guided perhaps some yeah. of the writing of this book? Absolutely. So uh, what I wanted to do, if we're going to have more meaningful, deeper, authentic connections. And at the end of the day, I mean, listen, Karina, when somebody's on their deathbed or near the end of their life or contemplating the end of their life, there, there's probably two things that they that they think about. Who didn't die form a relationship with, or what do I what regrets do I have over the relationships that weren't deep enough? And two, they have the gratitude over the deep connections that they've had in their lives. Really, that's about it. Okay. Um, everybody that I've talked to, um, that that those are two out. So that, that's all based on emotion. And um, so I needed to find a framework. Uh, what emotions do we have in common and why do we have different emotional responses to things? Because you know, as well as I do, that somebody could look at something um, and have fear or somebody could look at something and have joy because it's an opportunity, right? They might have fear because it's an obstacle. Somebody else might have joy because it's an opportunity. It's the same thing. So we all kind of have these eight basic emotions and Dr. Plutchik's, uh theory is that these eight emotions, which are basically four emotions opposite of each other, you know, anger versus fear and, you know, wh whatever, uh, is are based on our survival instincts. And so we all share these same emotions, but there are additional layers of these emotions that probably bring us like not everybody at their base has fear about everything, but you might have some hesitation or you might have apprehension, right? And so what I wanted to do was to understand, um, since we all have the same base understanding, the same base emotions, all of us do, that how could I understand, better understand how somebody might react to something with gratitude and somebody else might react to it with regret? Like why? Why is that? Because like for one, for example, Karina, I got you'll get to one story if you if you find time to finish reading the book, where somebody was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, and when told this by her husband, um, started streaming tears of joy and said, "Thank God it's cancer." I, and I'm like, "Huh? I I couldn't even imagine that." Or you read Bobby's story, right? Bo Bobby's story is filled with gratitude and filled with hope and optimism, even though it's unbelievably tragic and unbelievably um, heartbreaking to know what he had gone through. And so I really wanted to understand the emotions involved so that if I have somebody going through something that's close to me, or if I'm going through something, like how do I connect on that emotional level? I just wanted to understand people's emotional responses. And usually, with their cancer or their 
you know, as a witness or as a caregiver or whatever, they had one overriding positive emotion and one overriding negative emotion. You know, when I asked them, what's the first thing that, that came to your mind? It could have been something positive, such as gratitude or joy or happiness, or it could have been something negative, such as fear or anger or despondency or whatever. And so I really wanted to understand why that was and, and, and give us a way to relate to people that were going through trauma. Wow. Well, I can't imagine finding out I had terminal brain cancer and saying, oh, thank God it's cancer. I, <laughs> it's a little well, shocking. Can I give you the background on that really quick? Yeah, I'm betting it, she thought she was going crazy or something. It seems, it seems to be un unreasonable. And when I first heard it, I thought it was unreasonable because I was told the story is this. Here's this beautiful woman. She's had six kids. And one of them, unfortunately, died at 18 months. It was very, very tragic. A very um, wonderful, long 25-year marriage to her soulmate. They got through difficulties together. They 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 were both very successful on many different levels um, and very close family, extended family. I mean, there was really, they were living just a very full, vibrant, relatable life, right? Just, mm -hmm. just fantastic. But she started, like you said, she started to change and she started to become angry and she started to not um, treat her family in the same way. And um, it, just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And eventually she got to the point where um, she was definitely not herself. And in a moment of clarity, uh, uh, she said to her husband, it's been a couple of years now that I have been uh, spiraling down into this hole and I am never gonna get out of it. And you have to put me away. You have, you have to get me checked out. There's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And so, they uh, put her into a men's mental institution. I mean, she had seen every doctor, you know, imaginable. They put her in a mental institution because she, in that moment of clarity, said, it, "It's me. I'm the problem. I'm, 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 I'm not myself. I'm, I'm in this dark hole. And I'm never coming out." And that was uh, the point that she realized that her family, her dreams, her her life, everything was was gone, um, mm -hmm. and it was her. She was the cause of it. And so when she was put into this institution, um, they did a battery of tests on her and right away found out that she had a grapefruit sized tumor in her brain oh, and wow. called up her husband and said, you need to get down here right away. Surgeries have been uh, prepared for. We've, we're going to bring in the best doctors possible. She probably won't make it through the surgery. And if she does, she won't live long after. But that's what's going on. And so he races at three o'clock in the morning to the hospital mental institution that she's in and grabs her hand and wakes her up and says, I need to tell you something. And her response is, thank God. I mean, thank God it was cancer because for years she's been thinking that she's spiraling into this dark hole. That's, that's her and her mind. And she's just, you know, come to the realization that it's her and that she's crazy and that she needs to be locked up away from everything that she's built and everything that she loves. When she found out that it wasn't that, imagine the joy that she felt. And so um, how am I to tell somebody how to re um, respond to things? But holy cow, I can totally relate to that story. I can totally relate to the just the despondency that she must have felt to realize that everything that she had loved and cherished and built was gone and she was the cause of it. And then to find out that she wasn't the cause of it, how dramatic is that? And I so mean, you would feel liberated in a way. Yeah. It's, it's like, okay, it's, this was outside um, of my control. Yeah. It was a sickness and not like a mental collapse. It was literally a tumor. Yeah. So, wow. I mean, that is so moving mm -hmm. now. I mean, I find myself reflecting through this conversation on my journey as a, a distance runner for you know a few years. I now have the gift of bunions, so I've stopped the distance runs, but <laughs> still do enjoy jogging and just you know have pain if it's longer than about four miles. So I think one of the things that I was personally driven to do through my distance training was work through the pain of feeling so outside of control for the situation when somebody is dealing with you know, the potential end of their lives and mm -hmm. you're close to them and you care and you want to do something. So there was something for me about physically pushing myself 
to the point of being beyond a limit that I thought was there that helped me cope with that pain in a way. Mm -hmm. And to go on this journey of discovery of really pushing beyond the boundaries of what I thought I was capable of at the same time, thinking about the, the reality of their situations in treatment with chemotherapy or something along those lines, working to push beyond their own boundaries, what they thought they could handle. So I wondered if you could talk about that and, and share if this is your experience too, because mm -hmm. cycling 5,000 miles over six weeks in a solo trip, I mean, that's a lot of solo time thinking, okay. biking, or just getting completely blank. I mean, I know sometimes some of those moments would have been completely blank. Um, yeah. And so, uh, look, for 20 years, I've been doing Ironmans and 50 mile runs, 100 mile runs, you know, multi day bike rides, you know, you name it, I've done it. And one of the draws for me of endurance athletics is that ability to get super deep and reflective and contemplative about problems in life and whatever. But I have come to realize that, um, that when, you, when you're told to go do something such as, I don't know, go, go climb a mountain or run a marathon or do a hard project at work or start a business or something, if you're told to go do those things, they're definitely much harder and they come with a lot more fear and apprehension than if you elect to do them on your own. And by electing to do it on your own, um, you know, when, if, if somebody told you, Karina, hey, I want you to go run a marathon in three months before you had ever done it, you, you might say like, ah, I don't, I'm not really motivated to do it. And I'm kind of fearful of that. I don't know if I can accomplish that or whatever. But if you and turn the table and went around to all your friends and said, hey, I know you don't know me as a runner. I've never run in my life, but I'm going to go do a marathon in three months. It's a whole different set of reality and facts. Right. And so that was um, it's something that permeates into other parts of your life as well, um, that um setting a goal and accomplishing it, overcoming the fear, uh, finding out what you're made of, um, seeing how far you can push yourself because you're trying to push yourself. These are things that can permeate into other parts of your life. And when I was on the bike ride, which, I mean, I've done lots of individual days like that, even some multiple days like that, but to do 45 days in a row of, you know, minimum seven hours, average of almost 12 hours a day, some days as long as 17 hours of, of cycling, um, day after day after day after day for six weeks, um, I definitely solved a lot of problems because there was a lot of contemplative space there and a lot to process. And, and, and that was a gift. It was a definite, uh, it was definitely a hard thing to do uh, each day. No, no, no doubt. But it was also a gift because uh, because I was doing it for myself and I was doing it for this project, it had the right motivation and the right place for me so that I could be in a good emotional state during the time. And um, that's where I absorbed the most about what was going on around me each day and the people I spoke to about this this project. And it also allowed me to contemplate the stories on a deeper level because when you're in the middle of Texas, biking for 14 hours of the day and you don't, you know, you just keep moving, man, you can solve a lot of problems. Well, that brings me to my next question, which has to do with the process of writing. Mm -hmm. I personally find that most of the writing that I do happens in my head before I ever put pen to paper. I'm thinking about it. I'm processing what I've learned. I'm even deciding, you know, where I'm headed next, even with an article, you know, a paper in college, it was the same thing because so much of the writing is actually off the page before you get to it. So I wondered what the longest stretch was between these 15 different individuals or groups that you were working to tell the story mm -hmm. of. And if there was perhaps, you know, some grand kind of moment of realization that occurred because you're on these incredibly long distance rides for a lot of that time all by yourself. Um, I, I just wondered if you could share something along those lines. You know, that's a great question. I've done a lot of these, the, these kind of shows and, and I appreciate you, you having me on. Nobody's really asked me that question and it, it just hit me what, 
yes, there was kind of like this magic moment, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of the same way with writing as it goes on in the back of my head. But as you know, um, once you get it out on paper, it sounds different because the voice that we have in our head is very different than the voice we have on paper and definitely way different than the voice we have reading what's on paper. So, um, so yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I let it, I let it marinate in the background, uh, sometimes for years, right. I had been interviewing these people for a couple of years. So, um, I knew them really, really well, even though I had not met most of them, I'd met a few of them, but I'd not met most of them. And so that connection of like meeting them in person with who I knew them, who I thought I knew them to be was very uh, separated. So I need what I, why I went on the bike ride was to connect that. I mean, con if we're all connected. And so the point that made me kind of realize um, the true essence of this project was um, when uh, I was about in Louisiana and I had had, two or three nights in a row of running into complete strangers who did the most unbelievable tiny little things that were so monumental to me um, I, for this project, having never met me, having never heard of it. One night was um, I, I was, I was in a little restaurant in Louisiana to make a long story short and the waitresses hearing what I was doing all got together and gave me their tips for the night to, to give to the project. Because you know every, everything goes to to cancer research and and care and all the all the proceeds from everything, and so they had heard about this and they didn't know me from anybody, and and here and 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 here they they worked all night and gave me their tips so that they could make a donation for what I was doing and I was like huh, and the reason why is because each one had a story like you like like you did about your grandma, I mean you've had a, probably two dozen stories since then, but they had a story. Mm -hmm. And the next night I was, I, I watched, checked into a hotel. It was the longest night I had had. I, was, I checked in the hotel at like one thirty in the morning and the woman behind the counter came racing out. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. You know, my grandfather died of cancer two, two weeks ago and I was so close to him and I, I read about what you were doing and I was so excited to, to talk to you because I want to ask you a question. What can I say to my grandma? And I'm like, what the heck? And I realized at that point, Karina, that that connection, we're, we're all connected by this. It just hit me. Like, I want to find people that I think are connected. Everyone is connected by this, by trauma, by loss, by the fear of losing someone, by somebody going through something as difficult as cancer and not knowing what to say. We're all connected by it. And that's when I was just like, ah, that's the thread. That's the thread of the book. That's the thread of the story is that we're all we're all connected. Yeah, which is a very optimistic, powerful thought because we're all just living our own lives, and I don't know anything about you, and you don't know anything about me, and that's the way it'll be for most of the people that <laughs> that exist in the world. But you know what? We're all connected by that one thing. Well, what I venture to guess is that those moments actually came up when you needed them most, whether or not you even acknowledge that, because I, I've had a very similar experience where it's like suddenly this thing that you're working so hard for someone else acknowledges and brings a story forth that offers that inkling of inspiration that keeps you inspired to keep going. Even as you have those saddle sores, even as your, your body is fighting you for pushing your muscles to continue going like this every day upon day upon day for 45 straight. I mean, yeah, I it, understand how yeah. hard that is. I really and, and do. It's shocking. You're so insightful. It's shocking that when you need it the most, somebody was there. When I needed it the most, somebody was there. Mm -hmm. Right. And when when I knew nobody was going to be there, I figured out a way to to not need somebody. It's is very weird. But like, uh, I mean, there was a time in Texas where I was getting like five flats a day because I was on the interstates and those little radio still belt with the radio, you know, oh, tiny yeah. little piece of wire. <laughs> they pop through your tire and. And I mean, this and, is part of the reason I transitioned to mountain biking from road cycling. <laughs> yeah, it's just the, the flats and the heat. So I'm on this freeway in, in Texas. I'm literally down to one tube and I'm getting four, five, 
six flats a day. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm out at my wits end because I'm stuck on a freeway. I got one tube left. I don't even know what to do. And all of a sudden, some dude stops on the, on the freeway and he comes running after me going, man, what are you doing on the freeway? And you got these bags. You got to be coming from somewhere far. What are you doing? And I told him in, a, in you know 30 seconds what I was doing. And of course, he had had as somebody that was going through cancer right then and he was a big cyclist and he's like ah, go th- get off here turn right turn left go two miles this way and whatever the like bike store you you tell them to stop in you ask for my name and they'll take care of you and it was like man who knew that i needed that at that point other than the universe you know right so well and when i think you're spending all of this time alone you tap into something different that people aren't typically i think aware of and and this is just something I've experienced when I travel alone. If you're gone for long stretches, spending this time with yourself, it's almost like you you just feel you feel the connection or you feel the thread to to other people and and whether or not you even know them, it just feels like the universe kind of brings these moments together at the at those particular point in time. And and it's not like this is something you could really scientifically talk about, but time and again we hear these stories or we experience these things where just when you need it most that's when someone is there for you. And it's not like you could say, oh, well, I solicited it somehow from the universe, but in a way, perhaps you did. It was like a cry for help that you didn't even know you were uttering. Yeah. Yeah. It really is uh, uh, tough to contemplate. I try to capture some of that in the, in the book because mm-hmm. the book is the 15 stories and those are you know moving, inspirational. Some of them are tragic, but hopeful. Each one will leave you with a better understanding behind the thought of what people are going through or what they've gone through so that we can maybe bring that to our own lives and try to connect with them. But in between each of the 15 stories is a short narrative of the bike ride, Mm -hmm. which includes uh, me trying to come to some understanding about my life and losing my sister and, you know, some other emotional issues, but I don't get super deep into, into that. They're, they're pretty short, but more I talk about the people I met and kind of the weird interaction with the universe as it were, of of that thought of you know people are there when you most most need them and you you didn't you didn't know you did um you know and and all the other you know beautiful life lessons that i learned um and it really is when you sit back and think about it it's like i can only understand it through you telling me a story because it's just it's just weird right it's just weird how, how how could you need something at that particular time in the middle of nowhere and then all of a sudden some somebody comes along it's it's just really it's really interesting. And I think if you're seeking it, it becomes uh, somewhat of a barrier to if you're just open to it. Mm-hmm. Do you know oh. if you're seeking it, right? If you're looking for something, oftentimes it's harder to find than if you're not looking and all of a sudden something appears and you're like, holy crap, that's what I've been looking for. Well, and listening to your intuition, you know, yeah. like yeah. listening to that little feeling like I just need to walk down this way. I'm not sure why, but I do. And then encountering a person that could even change your life. Or as Bobby tells the story of, you know, really the relationship he had with Brandy following the, what was it? The moment this woman wanted to introduce him to her friend and he was hesitant. He hesitated. And yet he said, okay, why not? And this ends up being the woman who changed his life Mm -hmm. from being an angry person to something more, even though he loses her only a few short years later. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, there is meaning in these moments and sometimes we just need to listen. Now, I wanted to share something from my personal experience of dealing with grief, because even though in this case it wasn't cancer, I think people listening to this might find comfort and solace. And and that is that when I was handling the deepest grief I can recall ever being exposed to, one of my dear friends, my best friend from college was murdered. Um, and it was a senseless attack, a random attack out of nowhere that nobody could have anticipated or ever prepared for. And during that cycle, so many of us, because she was ripped from us like this, you know, just immediately Shannon, Kathleen Collins, one day here and then gone. Right. We all recognized that we would be on the verge of crumbling if even asked of a few simple words, which were, how are you? And if we got asked these words, by somebody who wasn't living this with us, it was like we would fall apart. And so we started to greet each other with a new kind of way of connecting. We would say simply, hi, I love you. Mm -hmm. And we kind of had this rule through our community because 
there was in these few words, acknowledgement of, yeah, we're in this and it sucks, but I love you. And I want those to be the words that I'm greeting you with. And I think it helped us to navigate some of the more difficult moments of the grief, even while we were in some cases handling that with self-destructive habits, like drinking far too much and continuing a multi-day wake (laughs) to just deal with the trauma of having lost one of our dear friends. So I counsel people when they are confronting grief, when they come to, oh, what do I say to my grandmother at that moment that you had where someone says, what do I say to her? You know, some, uh, a virtual stranger. I think it's more than asking them how they are. It's saying, I value you and I'm here for you. And I think that action alone can help people navigate some of the darkest moments, even just knowing that you're there, that you're thinking about them and that you want to help them remember the person they lost in some way, or just be there with them to share in the experience of where they are presently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I mean, what a tragic thing. I can't even imagine what, what, what you, her friends, her family, even people that barely knew her or even knew of her. It was shocking. It was, it was shocked the community, right? There's no possible way to wrap your brain around it. There just Mm -hmm. isn't. And, you know, there isn't a verb or an adjective or a noun or whatever that you can put on it that would make any sense of it. It's just, it's not understandable. And, and it, and even saying that it's just, it, it's just, it doesn't even come close to explaining it. Right. It's right. It's just difficult. And I think that not asking how you are because you, you don't know how to answer that. I mean, Well, do they want an honest answer or do they just want you to say you're fine and you're not fine? And if you admit it, then your tone, like the whole moment, and then they might not want to ask you again the next time because, oh God, it's a time bomb, you know? Yeah. and Right. And so again, what we talked about at the very beginning, I don't know Mm -hmm. what to say. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to bring you down. I don't want to sound like an idiot. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that we don't say anything. And what I think a lot of people experience, I don't want to say this for you and your circle of friends, Karina, but what a lot of people experience is uh, some uh, sense of abandonment uh, because um, people don't know what to say and they know they don't know what to say. And so they would rather say nothing. And so they just, they just disappear. Uh, sometimes right. Because sometimes it's uncomfortable forever. for them because perhaps they have a hard time with grief too. And yeah. Maybe they have a hard time with death. I mean, there there's so much to unpack there that we'll never really get to the bottom of it. But what I would say from the experience that I've had with losing people from cancer or from the sudden grief that I was confronted with is often just telling people you care. That's everything. You know, I'm here. I care. I'm here. Mm-hmm. And, and also um, to form a deeper connection. Like I might not be able to ever come close to understanding the emotional um, journey that you have had to endure over this. Um, But what I might be able to do, if you and I had reason to want to, to need to connect at a deeper level, is instead of offering you sympathy or instead of trying to figure out what you went through, because there's no way I could fix it. There's no way anybody could fix it. It's not fixable. Mm -hmm. Right. Is maybe just to give you an opportunity to connect with me on a different level. And that's maybe asking questions such as, Oh my God, what was she like? Yeah. Because you want to remember them. You want to honor them. I mean, that was one resounding theme for the months that followed her demise. Um, Mm -hmm. We wanted to be around people who knew her because it felt more comfortable because you could reminisce and you could tell stories and even get to the point where you were sharing things that made you laugh and for that to be okay. You know, even to laugh and cry at the same time and for that to be okay. (laughs) Anyway, I, um, I reminisce and I I think about her often. I mean, honestly, um, we don't know each other. We could talk about this for hours and hours and hours because it's something that I could never understand and you can never make me understand, but it's something that we can both kind of relate to because Mm -hmm. of the traumas we've gone through because of our ability to be open to growth to our because of our ability to face difficult issues even if we're facing it in our own heads on long runs but there's that just little thread of connection between us that we have emotions that have been related to trauma and if we have a desire to connect at a more deeper authentic level then we'll kind of navigate those hard conversations as best we can rather than just 
ah, I'm going to move on because I don't want to say the right thing. And you're going to move on because you don't want to say the wrong thing. Right. That's the beauty of it, of it. And I think, like we said at the very beginning, that whole wanting to form deeper connections to, 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 to each other at the, you know, at the core of who we are, that's what I'm hoping discussions like this, books like this, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, educational experiences, just anything that can allow us and empower us to feel more confident to engage in these hard conversations, whether we're the one going through the trauma or somebody else is, all the better because don't we want to have these deeper connections? I mean, honestly, Karina, I met some people I'll never run into ever again. And I'm talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of them just on that little 45 day bike ride. And the, the thought of the connection that I had with them in the very short interaction, it has never left. It will never leave me, right? They're so impactful. And sometimes the briefest of meaningful, deep, true human connection over these issues can be just the thing we need. And right. so wouldn't it be nice just to understand a little bit better how we might be able to do, the, do that what, with agree. people in our lives or, or strangers? And, and that's what my hope on this on this book was. Well, I have to say, the cycle of lives. I'm holding it up here again for the screen for everybody. Um, I'm only 50 pages in. It's a great read thus far, and I'm looking forward to the next 300. To be frank, <laughs> I, I will enjoy it um, piece by piece. And I think that even reading stories like this helps you work through your own kind of relationship with your grief, especially if you've been touched by people who some just whatever whatever loss you've experienced, right? It doesn't have to be from cancer. Like I, I found this, uh, the pages I've read thus far, are just incredibly insightful. I enjoy the journey. I enjoy the perspective. And as somebody who has participated often in distance athletics, I have such respect for the work you did to mm. create this book and for the powerful 5,000 miles that you rode to tell its story and to really connect with these people in person. Now, before we wrap, I do want to share with people, you know, there were a couple surprises for me, even in those first 50 pages. I really wasn't sure what to expect when I got into Bobby's story, if it was going to be written more narratively, but it really felt like you worked really hard to tell the story in his voice. Yes. And so I expect that each of the 14 experiences that follow will be in the voice of the people that you're telling yes. the stories of. Is that correct? It is correct. And, wow. when you get, and, and it's that really, is hard. It's so hard. <laughs> it, it's really hard. And especially if you can imagine, listener, that um, these are people I'm talking about their deepest, darkest Every single one of them told me multiple times, well, okay, we can talk about this, but I've never really talked about it before. You know, this one little aspect of their thing. I had to go deep, 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 deep in order to be able to do that because I wanted it to not to be from my voice because I'm not in their lives. I'm not a part of their life, right? And so um, when you think about it, like, like, like how could somebody tell your experiences in life, Karina, the, or, you know, this traumatic experiences and do it right in your voice getting inside of your head it's a scary thing to do well i and think that I, you just revealed that your next book is likely to be a novel because if you can yeah. do that you can write novels <laughs> yeah and, and i do i do write fiction as well and and and, and traditional nonfiction. I, I i do other things but that's the that's the thing that is the hardest like when you get to jen's story jen's story is about uh losing her dad when she's only six years old Wow. And how, and then we talk about how she grows up, and how the community and her family was was the place for her to develop a a oneness with the world, and just this beautiful. She's a beautiful soul, uh, coming out of this tragedy of losing her dad, and then became um, a a pediatric oncology nurse um, because she kind of had this connection to, you know, young people going through this kind of trauma. And when I sent her her story, it was really traumatic for me because I'm doing it in her voice. Imagine me trying to say, here's what is in your head. Because I'm not changing the name. These are real people, real mm -hmm. stories. There's, Go look them up. They're not anonymous, right? They're real people. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is their real lives. So for me to send 
you know, Karina's story about here's how you went through some traumatic event and how it's affected you throughout your life. And I'm telling it as you would. That's a scary place for a writer. So um, thankfully, in Jen's case, which was I don't know why I picked her, but she's probably the one that I had the most um, awe and respect for for that process. You know, and she called me up and she was crying and she was like, it's so beautiful and I don't want to change a word. And I've shared it with my mom and my friends mm. and it's perfect. I mean, oh, like, oh, the relief. The because, relief. Yeah, you did great work. And there were a few people who are like, yeah, I don't quite remember it that way, but OK, it'll work. Or, you know, <laughs> it wasn't exactly perfect. But um, but yeah, each story is told from their perspective in their kind of voice. Um, first person -y, and and I'm not in any of those stories. So, um, you know, you really get to hopefully feel what they're feeling. Yeah. Well, again, I think that's part of the reason I'll enjoy it so much and why I intend to finish it. So thank Hi. you for sending me the book. Thank you for spending the time on this interview and for your continual hard work representing people who otherwise might not have their stories told. I think that's incredible. And I hope all my listeners will go and check it out. You can go to david-richman.com. That's R-I-C-H-M-A-N.com or cycleoflives.org to find out more, pick up your copy. And as always, I encourage everyone who is listening or watching this broadcast to go to caremorebebetter.com. There I include complete show notes, links to everything we talked about today. Perhaps I'll even link to that article about my friend's death, Shannon Kathleen Collins, who great. if you want to, you can explore that story. It was truly tragic, but we had to actually lobby Congress to get some laws changed so that nobody else would experience what we had to go through as well. So I will link everything in show notes as always, along with complete transcripts so that you can review that as well. Just visit caremorebebetter.com. Now, as we close today's show, I want to invite all of you to tap into your curiosity, seek out and support efforts like cycleoflives.org. You can contribute to the work that David is doing to bring more awareness and funds to cure cancer. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with your community. You can do so just by sharing this link with all of your friends or even going to their phone and downloading the episode right onto it. So they're more likely to listen. You can even grab that phone and do it yourself. Now, um, this is important stuff, especially for those that are dealing with surviving cancer or trauma of any sort. If you have questions, I hope that you'll send me a note to hello at caremorebebetter.com. You can send them to me, to David. I'm sure we'd both love to hear from you. Thank you listeners now and always for being a part of this pod and this community because together we can do so much more. We can care more and we can be better. We can even regenerate our social systems and this planet we call Earth. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good.